Let us pray. Gracious and loving God, you are here with us. And we thank you. God, help us to open ourselves up to your presence. Help us to listen. Help us to see. To think and to feel. God, I I invite you once again to speak through me and in spite of me. That my words somehow might contain your message of life. God, thank you for encouraging us, for affirming us to be the people that you have called us to be. God, we love you and we thank you. We pray all these things in the strong, resurrected name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. So there is a transition ahead for all of us in one way or the other because transitions are inevitable because transitions are a part of life. We have, as most all of you know, been called to a, to a new transition. It was unexpected, but we're United Methodists. And in the United Methodist Church, as pastors, we sign a covenant that says that we will go where we are sent, where we are called to go. And so we have a few more weeks with you here, and we enter into a time personally of of transitions. So we are beginning to pack up our home. We are beginning to set dates. And when you sell your home, there are a lot of repairs that need to be done that you had no idea about. Roofers, electricians, plumbers, a handyman, a handy woman or two, anyone? Ready? We're, we're in a process of, of transitioning. And, and I, I feel it I feel it deeply. And, and, you know, as we're packing up, one thing about transitions is, is they age you. They age you. When I came here, my beard was not gray at all. <laughs> at three years, no, I, I'm serious. And, and so transitions age us. They're, they're, they're part of life, but we see them all through our lives. I was thinking about it uh, as I was walking around in my prayer garden, preparing for this sermon, walking around hundreds of times around these oak trees where I like to pace around and I thought about these transitions where where we had these little babies that couldn't hold their heads up and then they could hold their heads up and then they were crying because they were they were uh getting teeth and then uh and then they were saying their first words and we we kept wanting them to say their first words and then we were wanting them to stop talking so much and and all of these are transitions and they happen all in one from one to the other and sometimes they they happen like that sometimes they happen like it's a process, you know, the teeth are loose then and they wiggle and they fall out and then they, uh, you know, then they, they grow up and then uh, some, uh, a friend of mine said, you know, don't, don't blink. My, my son Jonah, middle son Jonah walked right through here and graduated from kindergarten. And uh, yeah, how awesome that was, so much love. And uh, everybody was crying and, uh, and knowing that it would be just a blink before they're graduating from high school and moving on to college. Life is full of these transitions. And, and the thing about transitions are they're inevitable and they're, they're necessary and, and it's God's plan for us. I, I remember Milton talking about these transitions where you're the, you're the little kid in the picture and then you're the, you're the dad and then you're the granddad and then you're not even in the picture. <laughs> it's a transition through life. It happens, but... Well, the thing about transitions is, is they're not comfortable. We, we, we're not comfortable in transitions. And, and I, uh, I'll, I'll give you even proof of that. In a contemporary worship service, y'all still sit in the same places every week. And, and we're cool, though. If somebody's in your seat, you don't. You're like, oh, we're cool. Yeah. We're not like other people that like, are upset because they're in our seats. You know, they were in our seats last week, too. And that's cool. But you sit in the same <laughs> You sit in the same areas, you know, and we, we're, we're creatures of habits. I mean, we wake up, and I wake up at the same time, even on days where I don't have to wake up. That's the beauty of transitioning into middle age, into a transition. You wake up, you, yeah, that happens. And, and so in, in a time of transition, in a season like this, for each of us, some of you, some of you are, are you know, they're, they're confirmants that are entering into a new place where, where you're responsible for this faith. It's a new season. 
You know, it's a public sort of declaration of your faith. It's a new, a new chapter. And I think of for all the, the parents kind of seeing, seeing this happen, it's another transition for them. Transitions all along the line. And when we're in seasons of transitions, what, what I need, what I need, and, and what I believe you need as well, is uh, first and foremost is prayer. Is prayer. Prayer of, uh, of encouragement. The, the very root, the, the word confirmation, there's this, there's this word firmation. It, it means to, you know, to be strengthened. And so when I, when I looked at, at what would be my prayer, there was already a prayer that, that really said this. And it's Paul, Paul's prayer in Ephesians. Ephesians 3, 14 through, through 21. And I, I love this prayer. It's a prayer that we get to kind of overhear. And the first thing that we have to know about this prayer is it's a, it's a prayer for all y'all. For all y'all. I grew up saying y'all. Y'all might have uh, grown up saying it in a, a different way, like you guys or use guys or something. But this is a prayer for all y'all. And when I think about this, I, I need this. And, and I know that you need this too. I, I think about people that are going through, I, I, I ran into my friend this morning who's uh, got two more chemotherapy sessions left before she's done. And they're transitioning out of this time of being, of being sick and looking hopefully into the future. And, and I just, I, I look at her and I, I don't know what to say. I say, be encouraged, be confirmed. I, I wanna give an affirmation. I wanna say, be strengthened somehow, be strengthened in this way. And, and so this, this prayer is, is important to, uh, to her to hear, important for, uh, for you to hear and important for me to hear. You know, somebody said that, the, I'm not really sure about this, but some of the best preaching comes because the preacher needs it. And so I see this in my life is, is when I came across this prayer in Ephesians, I was like, oh, thanks, Paul. That, I think that was for me. It's for all y'all. It's for the church in Ephesus and for the church today. And it starts off with this, with this call to, to be strengthened. Be strengthened. Paul says, I pray that out of God's glorious riches, you, y'all, may be strengthened. Now, first I want to talk about the glorious riches. It's kind of a vague thing. What comes to mind when you think of glorious riches? Maybe it's different for all of us, but I think what, what it means really is Paul's sort of saying, this is valuable. This is important. Think of the most important thing that you, that you possess, that you own besides people, maybe your house, your car, whatever it is, whatever is important and valuable to you. Out of this thing that is so important and so valuable, you, y'all, be strengthened with power through his spirit in your inner being. It's a essay anthropon. What Paul's saying is that it, it's literally in your inner man. Yeah, in, in the deepest part of you where sometimes we keep hidden, you know, we keep, uh, we keep it very guarded. This, this part of you that is who you really are in your deepest, darkest times when you're all by yourself, no one else is around and it's just you in your inner being. It's God's way of saying, get real, get real with this. That part, I pray that all y'all will be strengthened with power through his spirit in your inner being. Before Paul even prays this part about being strengthened, he, he names God. This is a classic uh, example of a collect prayer, which collects us and, and, and there's certain patterns to it. And he says, I pray to the father from which all families get their name. Okay, and what he's actually saying is, is I pray to the father of all fathers. Uh, and, and the Greek is, is literally, I pray to the father of all fatherhood or the parent of all parenthood. Like, like you parents, you, you know about this. This is where this comes from. We pray to God that you might be strengthened in your inner being. And then in a colic prayer, there's always a so that. Be strengthened so that so that Christ may dwell in your hearts 
through faith. So first he was talking about the spirit and now he's talking about Christ dwelling in your hearts. And for Paul, the, they're interchangeable. The spirit of Christ, the living Christ. Christ living within you. And this is one of those things that we say a lot in church. This, you know, the, that Christ is dwelling with, within you. That the Holy Spirit lives within you. But I want you to think about this. God is searching and seeking a body. Searching and seeking to become flesh and blood. Incarnation is what God does. God fills us up. God's work is done through us, through us individually, but that's connected to all. So it's a corporate filling, a corporate indwelling so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. Paul goes on to pray for new insights and understandings. And he says, I pray that you being rooted and established in love. I like that line, rooted and established in love. It is love that you came from. You are growing in this love, connected to this love that continues to grow you in the faith and establish you. May you have power together with all the Lord's people. I wanted to just take a pause right there and say that, that we are strengthened in community. This together stuff, this, this forms our identity. You know, we, we might think that we are who we are because we came about it on our own, that nobody helped us form our own personal identities. But that's not true at all. We're formed because of the group. We're formed by, by folks telling us this, these things, reminding us of God's love. I see others in church that are going through things and I am strengthened by their faith. There are some transitions that, that folks are going through that I haven't been through yet. And I always wonder how, how, is it that they, how is it that they remain strong and faithful? And it is spending time with them that, that strengthens my faith. I, I hang out with a guy here and I call him often and he prays for his wife every day. And he says certain particular prayers for her each morning and each evening. And she's been in heaven for six years. And sometimes he'll call me and I'll say, what, what is it? Is it is an anniversary or something? And he'll let me know. And he's all the time giving us these jewelry, this jewelry that belonged to his wife. And I get around this guy and I'm strengthened in my inner being because of his steadfast faith. He knows how to transition through chapters that I haven't even seen yet. It's a beautiful thing about our faith that we're all in this together, rooted and established in love together with all the Lord's people. Paul wants us to grasp this, you know? He knows it's impossible, but he describes it like this. I want you to grasp how wide and how long and how high and how deep is the love of Christ. Now, this is a, a book that, that is always filled with these, Ephesians is filled with these kind of universal language. It talks a lot about filling us to the full measure. It talks about the, the dimensions, the new understandings of how deep the love of Christ is for us. And I think with many, with different experiences through life, we get a different dimension, a different awareness of, of God's love for us in different seasons, in different times. You feel that too, it, that, that maybe you, you, knew God's love a certain way then, but, but then everything changed and shifted and there's a new dimension of, of God's love. And I think what Paul is saying here is, is, I pray that you feel the fullness of the love that Christ has for you. It's a love of, of Christ that surpasses knowledge. He says, he says this, and to know this love that surpasses knowledge. It's like, it's kind of a head scratcher of a saying. Like, like I want you to know this, but you'll never know it. You know, 
I'll tell it to you, but you'll never really get it. You'll never fully get it. What he's saying, I believe, is this, that, that it's one thing to know about something. It's one thing to, to, uh, to learn. And I think of our confirmants for this too. I mean, they learned all about it. You know, they learned, well, you know, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, this is our creed. This is what we believe. This is what we, this is what we know, you know? This is what we've thought about. You know, we've thought about grace. We've thought about provenient grace, sanctifying grace, justifying grace. We've thought about all of it. And we've thought about Wesley and we've said yes to this wonderful thing that we know. And we've, we've like, if you know there was a test, we could probably pass it. But the test isn't like something that you could take on paper. It's something that is a lifelong thing. And it's, some, it's a difference between knowing all about something and, and knowing a person in a personal way as a friend as an intimate friend or, or spouse, you begin to know. I, I, somebody could tell me all about my wife, all about her, describe her, but that's different because I know her, you know, I know her. And, and some of the stuff I would agree with, but it would only be just a fraction of really who she is because I know her. It's the same way with us to, to know this love, Beyond, beyond knowledge and be filled to the full measure, the fullness of God. You know, I, I, uh, I take great strength in this. And there's another verse that I, I came across that I get a lot of strength from too. And I'm, I'm, uh, I'll tell you this real quick because I, as, as one of the children said, I took a long time during confirmation. But it was a time in, in the people of God's history when, uh, when Moses Y'all know Moses had these transitions too. He was, I didn't really realize this, but he was 40 years old when he struck down that Egyptian, 40 years old. And then he, he married and lived and had a family. And then another 40 years went by and he's 80 years old. And then the burning bush happens that sends him to free God's people from slavery. So this is a transition. So, so then after that happens, there's another 40 years and Moses is, he's 120 years He's 120 years old, and he's the, the founding pastor of the organization, right? That it would be very intimidating, very difficult to follow Moses. And Moses knows that. And they're about to go into the promised land. And Moses says, hey, I'm, I'm not, I'm not going to go with you guys. And then there's this kid. I think he's a kid. His name's Joshua. And Joshua is called forward. And it's not that Moses is saying, Joshua, you're so awesome. You know, God's people are gonna be just fine with you. He doesn't say that. He says this. He says, the Lord himself goes before you and will be with you. He will never leave you or forsake you. Do not be afraid. Do not be afraid discouraged. So I don't know what it is for you if you're transitioning into uh, another, another job or a, another location, or if you're transitioning between, uh, between seasons in some way, or, or maybe it was an unexpected transition, and now you're in a whole new land, in a whole new place, with new people, new things, wherever it is, whatever that looks like for you. What I want you to know is that God's already there. God's already there, making a way for you. He won't ever leave you or forsake you. Don't be afraid. Don't be discouraged. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than we could ask or imagine. The message translation of this is just simply, you know, God can do anything, you know according to his power that is at work within us. To him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever. Amen.